Welcome everyone to this data site webinar on unlocking the power of data citation, the first release of the data citation corpus. Um, so I'm going to share my screen quickly. Give me one second. You should all see my slides, I hope. All right, so um, I have the honor of opening the event today and thanks everyone for taking the time to join. I see we have over 260 participants, which is great. Um, so before we have our presenters, um, Irache and Anna Maria today, I kind of want to give you a little bit of an introduction and background of what we're talking about. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the lessons learned from a previous research project that was funded by the uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and was uh, part of the Make Data Count initiative. So this uh, research project focused on a mixed method um, uh, studies to analyze data reuse and uh, also citing behavior and motivations. So we did some bibliometric analysis, a survey and semi-structured interviews. And all of that was to um, contribute to research data, uh, on data reuse to identify best practices to develop meaningful data metrics. Um, so what we found uh, actually was that in order to create data metrics, we need some kind of metadata. We knew disciplinary information was important, but obviously we also need metadata about citations. And uh, this improved from when we started um, or at the beginning of the project uh, to these are, this is the status um, from January of this year. But in the end, we also see that in the end, we only have 1.7% of data sets in data site that actually have a formal citation. So we actually see that um, the practice of formally mentioning um, a data set in your reference list is really not there yet. We're not capturing it. Um, so we also did a survey. Um, and then we also asked people about where um, they actually reference uh, data sets if they have reused it. And they do mention that um, they actually use so-called indirect citations, so citing a related paper about the data. Um, data citations were still common, but we also see a lot of use of um, researchers or authors actually mentioning data sets either in the body of the text and the captions, figures or tables, acknowledgements or appendices or in a footnote. So there's a lot of uh, um, kind of behavior of citing or referring to data sets that we currently don't capture um, in uh, something that's tracked by data site. We also asked about motivations of why do you even cite secondary data? So for us, secondary data was data created by other people. And um, we actually see behavior similar to what we know from literature citations. Um, so namely showing intellectual depth, what Robert Merton called so-called pellets of peer recognition, but also um, helping others to locate and access data to support the validity of your own uh, claims. And also what we, we kind of want to show with these metrics and value is uh, indicating data re reuse. Um, so before getting us started today, um, I kind of want to uh, refer you to the different types of um, how data can re be referred to. Uh, and the literature, um, according to that, also differs a little bit. Um, so when we talk about a data citation, we mean uh, referring to a data object in, in the reference list. So this is what traditionally data uh, site has captured. Um, so we would see it in the reference list of the bibliography. Others have called this a formal data citations uh, or a citation with a varying degrees of uh, completeness. So this can currently be captured automatically, but you saw that only under 2% of the data sets and data site currently have this information. Um, and so the part that we're really interested in, because we see that's happening pretty frequently, is what we call a data mention. So this is the part where uh, the data object is referred to throughout the publication. So this could be in the body of uh, the text, the footnote, a figure, or table caption, or supplementary material. Others have called this an informal data citation or intratextual citation. Um, and while this is easily traceable by humans, obviously, that read the paper, um, we need automatic methods re uh, to access the full text and then use uh, natural language processing or machine learning to extract those. And this is exactly what the data citation corpus today um, is about. I'm really excited to hear for where that project is at. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Irache. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for such a fantastic overview of why citations are important and also the different flavors of citations that we can get. 
Um, we are going to be touching on that a little bit uh, as part of, of the presentations. Um, so yes, I'm Irache Puebla, director of Make a Data Account. Um, and what I wanted to do in this part was give you a brief overview about the Make Data Account initiative and then tell you more about the motivation for the data citation corpus. So many of you who are here today with us may be familiar with the Make Data Account initiative. But for those who may be perhaps a bit more new to it, we are a community initiative with the goal to promote responsible metrics for open data with the vision to then enable evaluation and reward of research data usage and, and the reach of that open data. Uh, and by data metrics here, we mean meaningful and contextualized uh, measures of how open data sets are accessed or utilized. We have a number of areas of work. Obviously, infrastructure is key in making things possible. So one of our focuses is, is to build open infrastructure that can support collecting information around data usage and, and exposing that to the community. But we also work with uh, different groups to work on community-based standards so that we can, again, uh, develop best practices and normalize information about how data are being used. Uh, we also work with others to do outreach uh, to different groups, raise awareness about the importance of data metrics and uh, encourage adoption by different organizations and communities. And we are very keen on supporting the work of Stephanie and, and other groups who are doing bibliometric studies to develop this important evidence on data uh, usage practices so that we can build the all important context around those metrics that will help different users tailor that information to their specific needs. Um, I also want to, to mention briefly uh, the context for focusing specifically on data citations. We know there is usage beyond citations. Um, we are pretty much aware of that. Uh, but the, we think there are a number of uh, benefits in focusing on citations at this stage uh, as we seek to build further adoption and information on, on usage. Uh, one thing is that is particularly relevant is that citations provide that signal of data being used or reused in research because they create that relationship between the data set and the other research object. There are other benefits. Um, as Stephanie has mentioned, the practices around uh, citation by different communities. Uh, but overall, researchers um, care about citations, they value citations in terms of understanding the impact of their work. So that's also beneficial, is something that is intuitive to researchers. Importantly, we also have the, some of the building blocks necessary to capture information around citations through uh, workflows uh, that have been put in place by repositories and publishers. And where there were some gaps in those building blocks to capture that information, we have seen important developments in having new tools through AI, for example, that allow us to identify new uh, mentions or citations to data, for example, through mining full text of articles. So we may say, okay, great, there is great value for data citations, let's use them. Um, this is where the challenges and the pain points come in. Uh, we know that there is a strong interest in understanding how data is being used, but we are not there yet in having a complete picture from uh, data citations. Some of the workflows that we have in place are not necessarily optimized, uh, for example, in the context of some journal uh, workflows for depositing uh, metadata. And we also know that it has been, one of the key challenges that we have had is that for, from the perspective of data side, we, we believe in the power of DOIs and work with DOIs and our metadata, but we also know that there are many repositories that use accession numbers as the persistent identifier. And, and that's something that we have not been able to combine so far in terms of the citations associated with accession numbers and uh, with data, data sets that have DOI. So we know that's a particular challenge that we were experiencing. Um, the other aspect is that we also know that there were different uh, groups in the community that, again, due to their interest in this, and we are very keen to see many others also working on the same problem with us. Uh, they've been looking at ways of identifying citations to data through different methodologies, some of them uh, human curation, some others more automated. But this means that we have pockets of citations to data stored in different locations, and we, we were lacking this comprehensive uh, picture, this comprehensive resource to access all of those data citations. 
at least in, in a central place. Um, and this was really the motivation to work on this project to develop a, a data citation corpus, which is a, can we work collectively with the community in addressing those challenges that, that we knew from our work on, on data uh, usage. So we started this project last year, thanks to generous support from the Welcome Trust. And in fact, some of you may have been at the launch webinar one year ago. You may remember we had um, some of our speakers who are here today, but also others from the community who participated, telling us more about why they are interested in also capturing usage information for data, uh, and what they see at the challenges and, and why it is important to have this common resource that aggregates data citations. Um, and I think that one of the key elements in the discussion that we had when we launched the project last year is that there is a key piece of the technical infrastructure that needs to be worked on, but also that another key element towards the success of the project was going to be to have this community input and collaboration, uh, but having these conversations with different groups who are already working on the same problem and bringing those citations that we, we may have in, in different locations all together. So a key element of uh, community input and collaboration here. So a little bit about uh, the, the data citation corpus. Again, the main key goal here is to develop a comprehensive corpus that incorporates citations to data from different sources uh, into this centralized community resource that will be openly available. And again, the idea is to bring data citations that have been identified or stored through a diversity of sources. Some of them will be through their workflows for persistent identifier authorities. So the workflows that already exist for through data site and cross ref, but also leverage the fact that we have additional sources that are doing very interesting work to also discover or aggregate citations to a number of, of, of techniques. Um, for example, through machine learning and mining of the literature. Uh, before we get into a few more specifics, I also wanted to give a brief overview on some aspects of the scope for the data citation corpus. Um, and this is, as Stephanie has very nicely outlined, there can be different uh, opinions and perspectives as to what should count as a formal or informal uh, citation here for the purposes of the data citation corpus, what we are really aiming to do is create, uh, capturing those data set to article links, having those relationships available and aggregated. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that, again, um, in terms of the citing objects to data, the scope is uh, at the moment restricted to citations originating from papers or journal articles or preprints. We know that there can be citations through other open objects, but this is the scope uh, at the moment. And again, this is the data citation corpus. So the cited object will be a data set. We know that there are many different um, initiatives as well, thinking about this for other objects such as software. Uh, and I think it's something that we should also keep uh, in mind in terms of conversations with those groups, but the, the, the focus for the data citation corpus is on data sets. Um, and again, for the purposes of this uh, corpus, uh, we've defined the citations according to either the, um, the relationship uh, signal through the metadata that we have for the data set of the article that we know designates a citation, so this is for the citations that will be coming through uh, event data, the joint service from a data set and cross ref, or it could be a mention to a data set again through the methodology of text mining um, to identify that use of data set in that article. Right, so for us again, a key piece of this uh, uh, effort was to try to see how we could for the first time bring together citations to data uh, for data sets that uh, have DOIs, but also accessing numbers. And we were very pleased to be able to enter a collaboration with some Zuckerberg initiative um, to help us again, broaden the scope of the citations that we could put into the corpus to also include accessing numbers through doing a mining of the literature. So I'm thrilled to have here with us, Anna Maria Stratton, who is senior research scientist from the Chan Zuckerberg initiative. Open Science team, who is going to be telling us more about their part of the work uh, and their use of machine learning to identify data mentions. So I'll hand back to you, Ana Maria. Yes, thank you so much. I will be sharing my screen. 
Perfect. Um, thank you, Rache. Uh, and uh, hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Estrate. I am a research scientist at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Initiative and um, I'm really excited to chat with you today about uh, our contribution to building the data citation corpus and also uh, some of the insights we gather through this work. Uh, before diving into the methodology and what we've done, I want to set out the context of why we were really excited to partner with DataCite on this project. Um, so our goal at CZ Science is to support the science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. Uh, we believe that open science is one of the fundamental values that will help us get there. And uh, we uh, believe in the universal and immediate open sharing of all scientific knowledge, processes, and outputs. Uh, we want to be able to identify and democratize emerging and valuable methods, tools, and data sets, and uh, bring them to a broad and diverse set of, set of scientists so that they can come to meaningful conclusions faster. This is sort of our theory of impact. Uh, and we have, in fact, been uh, part of other similar efforts to create and share data sets on key research resources. We have just wrapped up a partnership with the Global Biodata Coalition to uh, surface biodata resources from full text papers to build the Global Biodata Resource Inventory. And uh, we also have created a data set of software mentions mined from the biomedical literature. So uh, hopefully that gave us a little bit of a context and uh, now we can dive deeper into some of the methods that we've used. Uh, and uh, we've already heard a little bit uh, about some of the challenges with data set citations and how current data aggregators uh, still don't have comprehensive coverage, uh, how many data sets are still not formally cited. Uh, that's sort of the motivation for, uh, for doing, uh, doing this work and going straight to the source and mining for these data sets from, uh, from the full text of papers because uh, the majority of the data sets will be mentioned in the full text of papers. So uh, this is why uh, this is a task that is suitable for something like machine learning approaches because uh, you can go and, and mine these, uh, these uh, data entries straight from the source. Um, again, we've already uh, went over this a little bit. I, I know there's a broad definition of what constitutes data. And I think uh, through this pro uh, in this project, we took kind of like a broad uh, approach to what constitutes data. Uh, for the purpose of this effort, we uh, we focus on our effort at least. We focused on access accession number IDs and DOIs. So uh, accession number IDs uh, are identifiers uh, in a repository. We have an example here of uh, two entries uh, highlighted from the Geo database. Uh, there are many more repositories. Obviously, uh, DOIs will be associated generally with a repository like Dryad, Zenodo, Mendeley, or many others. So um, our approach is, uh, is the following. Uh, we have a machine learning model that learns to extract mentions of data sets from text. Uh, this is a cyber model that is fine-tuned on the name entity recognition task and is trained to predict entries in a total of 44 repositories. Uh, we run this model on a corpus of 5 million full text papers from Europe PMC. And uh, what the model does is, is able to predict if a word is a data set and also the repository it belongs to. So uh, in, this, we have, uh, in this example, we have a sentence on, on the slide. Uh, the microarray data had been previously deposited at gene expression omnibus geo under accession number uh, GSE2603. What the model will do is, is not just be able to predict that GSE2603 is a, is a data set, but it will also be able to tell you that it is linked to the geo database. So uh, this is important because now that we do have the repository as well, we are actually able to link it to something like identifiers.org and linking is usually one of, uh, one of the uh, more challenging uh, aspects as well after you, you mine uh, these strings. Um, for training the model, we have used the subset of uh, European C annotations uh, that were further curated by our in-house team of biomedical curators. Uh, and uh, you can see the total of uh, the 44 databases we have mined on, on the slide, and they're in the pink table. Um, and uh, we have evaluated the model on a test set of 200 papers from European C that were uh, not included at all or seen during training. And on this outside validation set, uh, the model achieved a precision of 74% and a recall of 98% with an F1 score of 84%. We um, 
we, I, I want to mention that we also experimented with uh, other models, and in particular, I want to highlight a GPT-2 model that uh, we uh, we strongly considered using because it had a better precision around 90% worse recall, which is a trade-off we usually make with these models. Uh, we, we decided to go with the cyber model because uh, of time and cost constraints and the time and cost that we have taken to use the GPT-2 versus cyber one. We did a cost analysis, uh, and that, that's one from our decision. Uh, but it is the GPT-2 is still a very viable model for this task. Um, so once the model extracts a mention, such as GSC2, GSC-2603, uh, because now we do have the repository, we know this is a mention in the geo database. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are able to map it uh, uh, to identifiers.org and get back a unique identifier link. And uh, we are also validating these links by uh, checking the URL responses and only keep the URLs that return a status code of 200. And I'll come back to this in a little bit as well. Um, so for some examples of how, uh, you know, these accession number IDs look like in practice, uh, we have here two different papers and the mentions extracted. In the first example, uh, we have some mentions from the Proton Database Bank, PDB, and EMVP databases. And uh, these are under the data availability statement. Uh, the second example showcases some GenBank entries from different section from a different section of the paper. Uh, and as you can expect, there is a lot of variation in how these accession number IDs look even for one, one repository, how people mention them, the section of the paper they are mentioned in. So we are, uh, through this approach, we are uh, trying to mine everything. Um, I also want to go over some areas where the model is uh, likely to not perform very well because I think it's important to be aware of these areas. And uh, I want to start with false negatives um, because the model has a recall of 98%. It means that we should be catching most mentions, so we should not be losing a lot of these mentions. However, still, still some might still get missed. Uh, based on our analysis, this is likely to happen on very long sentences, and uh, this is actually based on how we train the model and also how we uh, process the full text papers, because during training, the input is truncated truncated, truncated to a maximum length. Uh, that might be shorter than some sentences in our corpus. So we have here an example of a really bad offender where we have a really long sentence, and uh, because it gets truncated, we're actually losing a lot of these mentions that, and we only catch what we see in green. Uh, some indication for this, I think in future iterations, definitely doing the full text processing maybe differently, you know, so look at, try to identify the long sentences, split them a different way, and maybe increase maximum length during training. Uh, because uh, model precision is lower at 74%, it, uh, it means that we will, uh, we will see false positives uh, more often uh, than false negatives. And uh, this is a trade-off we we kind of made when building the model, where we did uh, we did want to prioritize casting a net as broad as possible, and maybe go backwards and validate some of the links in other ways. Uh, and uh, you know, the precision recall trade-off is something usually uh, all machine learning models have to grapple with. Uh, one example we can see on this slide is a grand number that's being identified as a gin bank accession number ID. Uh, one way not actually in which we thought we could get over this would be uh, by cross-checking the status of the identifiers.org URLs, which we do. Uh, what we didn't realize is that some of these URLs can actually come back with a status code of 200, so they do resolve even if there is no resource found. So uh, a potential mitigation here would be to kind of do uh, some type of negotiation with the repositories themselves to check if an entry exists, so go to uh, go to the repositories themselves rather than just look at the status code of, uh, of the URL. And uh, we also want to call out that we noticed that the PDB entries in general are among the, no the noisiest. And, uh, we, you know, we believe, we believe, we have some theories. We, we believe this is because the PDB numbers tend to be short and easily can get easily modeled up if uh, the context around them is unclear. Um, other insights that uh, came through this work is, um, or are, uh, you know, on a small validation set we've all, that we've uh, looked at, we realized that only around 27% of data set mentions ha were having links in the full text. And I actually think this is a little bit higher than what we've seen previously, but, uh, you know, this is what came out for our, for our analysis. Uh, and only around 66% of data sets will have a database name in the paper. So uh, basically, if if you have something like a GenBank or a, a Rayexpress ID uh, accession ID, only around sixty six percent will actually have the database name mentioned uh, with it as well. 
Um, so hopefully I have convinced you that mining for accession uh, number IDs is not trivial. It's also not a solved task. Uh, we do hope our work is bringing us a step closer to understanding how to solve, solve this problem. Uh, future next steps could include focusing on mitigating false positives. So uh, one relatively uh, easy-ish thing we can do is again cross-check that entries are valid in, the, in their predicted repositories. We are check, checking the status URLs. We can also use some of the more recent large language models such as GPT 3.5 or 4, which are powering uh, ChatGPT, uh, or other open source large language models to help in cleaning up the false positives. Uh, when we started this project, uh, Cybert was uh, one of the state-of-the-art models at the time. Uh, but, you know, and we started this project, uh, I think, two years ago or something. Uh, just in the past year, we have seen way more powerful la large language models being developed. And uh, we can use them now to uh, to help us in, uh, in uh, for this task. So you can imagine you can prompt it, prompt something like ChatGPT and tell it is something like you are a helpful open science assistant in charge of checking if a data entry belongs to a data repository or not. You can try to see how it does with no information, maybe give it a few examples uh, and do something like two shot. And uh, if I were to uh, continue working on this or pick up this project right now, I would actually want to try some of these more powerful models on the task itself and see how it performs uh, compared with the cyber model. I, I would personally expect it to perform better. Uh, last but not least, we would love to see this as a community effort. It's part of, again, why we're so excited to be uh, partnering with DataSite. And uh, we would love to see uh, you know, community feedback of how, uh, how people are using uh, this work, uh, what, uh, what they are trying out, what, uh, what folks come up with. Um, and to sum it up, uh, our contribution was uh, an initial seed data file of these data set paper links that we've extracted with the ML model from 5 million papers from your BMC. And uh, really the methodology of, um, of uh, building this machine learning model for the data set uh, extraction task, task which uh, as far as we know, has not been tried before um, very, uh, very, uh, very broadly. Uh, we are committed to open sourcing the code we are uh, and models. We are in the process of doing that. Uh, our current plan is to put them on GitHub and Hugging Face, and uh, the ETA there is end of March. Uh, I want to end by highlighting everyone at CZI who was part of this effort. I worked on the machine learning models. Michaela helped with curation and evaluation. Uh, Fab was in charge of model deployment at scale. And uh, we got additional support from Dario, Jennifer, Patricia, and Dante, who is also here. Uh, thank you, everyone, and yeah, I'd love to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ana Maria, for this uh, great overview of all the all the work. And I think, um, as with many of these complex projects, also what the lessons were from from doing all of this. Um, what we wanted to do in the next few minutes was provide a, a brief overview of what's in the first release of the corpus, and I thought the best thing to do here. Um, is mostly to uh, this, I wanted to show you a, a dashboard that we've built to um, provide a high level picture of what's in the in the data file. And we are very happy to also sell the data file with anybody uh, who may be interested, but I'll be sharing my screen to show you the dashboard um, and so some of the uh, elements that we have included there in terms of visualizations. Uh, this dashboard is already open, so you're welcome to, to have a look. Uh, and we encourage feedback on this in terms of what may be the visualizations that you find most useful, et cetera. Um, this is essentially a number of tables and visualizations of the citations currently in the corpus, which include those that have been contributed by the Zuckerberg Initiative, as well as a bit over 1 million citations that were already available through the uh, data site event data. Um, so I'll go briefly over the different visualizations. The first one it provides a, a citation counts over time, starting from 2013 um, and displaying uh, whether the citation associates with the DOI or an accession number. It is also possible to filter um, the, uh, the graphs according to a number of uh, uh, filter facets related to metadata that we may have. Again, for some uh, of the facets, the metadata may be more complete than others, so just bear that in mind, but I'll just provide an example in terms of um, searching uh, for repository, for example, the Protein Data Bank uh, obviously has accession numbers, so that would filter for that particular repository 
uh, we can also complete, for example, for uh, say Zenodo that has DLIs. Um, this type of filtering is available for several of the graphs. And again, you're welcome to, to play with it and tell us what you think. Um, the second visualization provides the distribution of cit citation counts by publisher. Uh, this comes from the information about the publisher for the articles. I, I wanted to mention here because I think I saw some comments in the chat. Uh, about the publications that were mined, you may see that there is uh, an enrichment here in terms of uh, publishers that publish open access or that have a, a, a big proportion of publications in open access. And it's because we use open access articles again for, to do this full text mining. Um, we also provided an outline of the unique entities that are mentioned as part of the metadata that we have currently in the corpus related to, again, the, how many affiliations, founders, journals, repositories, and sub, subject areas. I'll talk to, about subject areas in a second. Uh, but this is mostly so you get an over, overview of what are the entities that are covered, what's the level of coverage. Um, the fourth visualization here relates to citations by subjects. So this aims to capture disciplinary information. I wanted to stop a little bit here because we wanted to have this visualization because we know from uh, community conversations, and I think Stephanie very nicely outlined this in the introduction, that discipline level information will be particularly useful in terms of understanding community practices and normalizing per discipline. Uh, this is one of the metadata aspects that we know is not well covered in the corpus. In fact, just under 1% of the records have this information. So this distribution here is based on the records that do have some discipline uh, information associated with the citation. They don't represent the whole of the uh, 8, 9 million included currently in the file. I just wanted to give that clarification so you don't go and say, oh, how comes sociology is the top one if it's not necessarily in the life sciences, which is uh, essentially the disciplines where the repositories that were mined uh, for full, te full text mining, uh, that those were the repositories that we were looking at. Um, right, and then at the bottom, we have um, uh, a graph showing the citation counts by source. This mainly aims to display uh, the distribution per source. Again, this has the, the citations from Sansaka Rag Initiative and the ones from Event Data. Um, there are only two sources here, that, so you slightly, uh, you know, we, we know that this will be more useful as there are more sources, but we wanted to display this because it's something that we are really embedding in our thinking about the corpus. We want to uh, make sure that it is, it will always be possible to uh, identify the source of the citation, again, because for different users that the methodology that led to the citation may be important. And then the last graph here is mostly aiming to display when the information was added to the file. You may see there that the bulk of the citations were added uh, around September 2023. Um, this is a snapshot. Essentially, this file for the data citation corpus seems to be a snapshot of, of what we aggregated through this collaboration with Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And we uh, are very much actively thinking for next iteration how we can have this continuous feed of citations into the corpus. So I welcome any any feedback you may have about the visualizations, etc. I just wanted to then, before we move to the Q and A, uh, go over a few other aspects of uh, the data citation corpus and some of the uh, next steps uh, that we have uh, in the in the pipeline. Uh, so very briefly, I'll just uh, put my slides back up. Um, Yes, as I mentioned, it will be key for the success of this project to, to have this community effort in bringing the different data citations together. Um, I just wanted to signal here the different ways in which community members can contribute. We had some questions from different repositories that we spoke with about ways in which they can contribute. The main one, I would say, is that continue to submit citations through the DOI metadata if you're already uh, doing so fantastic, keep doing it, um, raise awareness in your communities about the importance of those citations. And we hope that going forward, the corpus will also be a tool that you can use to uh, hopefully complement the citations that you already host 
and expose that through your platforms. We encourage publishers uh, to follow best practices in data citation by depositing citations to data as part of the metadata, the register with Crossref. Again, Crossref and data site work together on the event data service. So any citations that come through that workflow will be included in the corpus going forward. Uh, so that's a, another good way of contributing. Um, I also wanted to signal our interest in working closely with institutions and funders. We know many of them are thinking of ways of incorporating data into their evaluation processes. We hope that the corpus will be one of the tools in the toolkit that they may be using for, towards that. And we want to make sure that we have feedback to make it as useful as possible for those uses as well. And if you have data citations through other means, please do come and talk to us. We're very keen on hearing about uh, projects and methodologies that you may be using to, to identify data citations and, and talk with you about how to incorporate them into the corpus. Um, our next steps are that we are going to continue our conversations with other groups to incorporate additional sources into the corpus. Again, we know that there are gaps in metadata that we need to work on. I already mentioned the discipline uh, aspect. There are other metadata fields that we think are important that we know we need to think about for future iterations. That's one of the areas where we very much welcome feedback so that we, we know what are the critical pieces that we should be focusing on. And again, continue our conversations uh, with the community so that we can have feedback for different uh, from different uses. Uh, something I wanted to mention is, again, we have the data file that is available to anybody who may be interested. We have a form to, to that you can use. I promise it's not very long. Um, you can also use that form. It's included in the in the slide. If you just want to hear more about the project, want to hear more, how is this relevant to me, please do get in touch and we will follow up. We are sharing the file with anybody who, who requests it. We have had over 50 requests, which I think is fantastic in terms of seeing the interest in the project. Um, I listed there a few of the uh, uh, individuals and, and type of roles who are requesting the, the corpus data file for the purposes. There may be researchers who want to use it potentially for their own studies, repositories to find more citations to add to their platforms. Again, librarians and institutions trying to understand whether this is a, a tool that they can use and how to improve it for those purposes and also other infrastructure providers who, who want to compare and uh, versus what they are doing. So I encourage anyone with interest in, to contact us through the form or email me directly. We'll be showing the contact details, etc. And very much uh, welcome feedback. So I think probably I see already that Q&A has been quite active. So I'll stop there so there is time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Riace and Anna Maria, for these really great results and introduction. And thanks, everyone, for putting uh, your questions in the Q&A and, and for this really lively discussion. So I'll do my best to cover as many uh, as possible. But uh, this is also just a hint that we will be following up with you if we don't have the um, opportunity to, to answer your question right here. I think there are a lot of questions um, that I'm trying to group now related to the, the data quality of what's currently um, already captured. And Anna Maria, you already went into some of this of uh, the precision and the recall. Um, but uh, especially Henry and Roderick here were bringing up some things that uh, of the false positives. Um, and Jeroen also has a question of how the um, the performance of the, the model is doing and if you have uh, tried to benchmark it to other. So I was wondering, Anna Maria, if you can spend a little bit of time talking more about um, the false positives, the, the precision, uh, as well as how the algorithm is performing to, um, I think the Kaggle competition that was launched before that had a similar um, direction. Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, uh, the evaluation we did was around, around 200 papers uh, that were not seen at all during training on that validation set. Uh, we saw a precision of around 74% and recall of 98%. So uh, we are expecting precision to be a little bit on the lower side. Uh, from our analysis, again, uh, I think grand numbers and uh, kind of like PDB entries seem to be the noisiest. And uh, I think, uh, you know, some mitigations there, uh, again, we'll just like be maybe checking with the repositories themselves if the entry is valid. Um, we haven't benchmarked it on the Kaggle data set, so I can speak to that. 
Uh, I do think that, uh, so I'm, I'm only talking about accession number IDs. I don't know about uh, on the DOI side. Um, I, again, I, you know, uh, we recognize this is a challenging task and mitigating false positives is, uh, kind of is important. We we acknowledge that. I do think this is why it's important to also figure. We all figure out a way to deal with that. Uh, and I mentioned some next steps in uh, in my presentation as well. We're not claiming this is done by any means. I think this is just like the starting point, and we're trying to say, you know, this is what we've tried. This is what we've seen. Uh, these are potential next steps, and uh, this is, we're we're just looking at this as the first iteration, really. Yeah. And Stephanie, if I might yeah. chime in briefly on that. Um, hi, everyone. Matt Fais from Data Site. And there's a lot of discussion around what about this source, what about this source. And just to clarify that the Data Citation Corpus is uh, set up as an open global community resource aggregating from multiple sources. And so we've worked in this first iteration with CZI to partner and really seed the corpus. But over time, in future iterations, you're going to see additional sources coming in. And those are um, categorized in two categories. One, we have categories where there's uh, metadata from persistent identifiers. So where the persistent identifier has record of those relations, of those citations. Um, so that can come from a publisher, a repository. And then the other category is what we're doing with CZI and others. So we could include Julia Lane. Um, the, the, these are, you know, folks that are third parties that don't have authority over the persistent identifier metadata and can say, hey, we know that there's a connection between this and this and that we validated. And so we do need to keep in mind that we are on a journey here together, that we're working through iterative releases. Perfect is the enemy of goods. And we've had some really good feedback. And this is this is the the spirit of community and Roderick's been sharing some great feedback and, and some really good insights. And, and we know that these things exist and we're working together to how do we improve these subject classification is a challenge across the community. And when we set out with the corpus, as an example, we, we thought, oh, well, we can pull from, say, Crossref metadata. And the reality is not a lot of that exists in Crossref metadata from the publishers. And so we have to look at different techniques to go and get better metadata. So just want to make the strong point that it's not limited to just one model or one source. And what you see today is just the start. And we are on a journey together in scaling up the sources. We have the pipelines and the model working. Um, but there's a lot of things that we've learned through that. And we want to work together with the community in improving. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and I think maybe you to follow in this, this general direction, this could be a question for Irache or, or Matt too, but there's a question about, um, did you look at social science repositories? So maybe talk a little bit about, you know, where you started and maybe what the avenue is to, to broaden that in the future. I'm happy to start, but Matt do add if, if needed. I our vision for the corpus is obviously to cover uh, as many disciplines as we, as we can. Um, I think that, and, and Maria may be able to also speak to, to the context, but I think for for this iteration, because we knew that having access in numbers had been a challenge, we wanted to say, okay, what are some repositories that we know are very embedded in community practices where we know there is usage, we know there is data that is being mentioned in articles. Um, and we also have access to, to curated terms that will allow us to, to know what we are looking for with some confidence to start with those well-established repositories and th they happen to fall in the in the life sciences. We saw this as, as others were saying, as a first step and in saying, can we do a proof of principle that gives us a good sample of uh, uh, citations for accessing numbers and then build from there. We are very keen on going beyond that. And in fact, I've been having conversations with, with some groups interested in the file work. They, they were coming from the social sciences. They wanted to see if there were, would be citations for, for their disciplines. So I was very clear in saying, okay, probably, you know, they may, there may not be so many from, <laughs> from the repositories that we looked at. But I have been asking for details and we have some suggestions already of groups from the social sciences who are doing good work to again do curation or establishing links for citation to article for their disciplines and we certainly have it in our plan to reach out and, and see how we can work with those. 
Thank you. Um, so there are also some questions um, that go a bit in the direction of what is even data? <laughs> what are we capturing? Uh, what are we not capturing? So Paolo is asking you, for example, is there a clear definition of a data set or research data um, uh, that we're referring to? And I think related to is also Chris Gibson's question of is MDC capturing citations to data that does not underpin a publication? For example, is the data the data is published but has no associated publication and at a later point others might then reuse that data and cite it in their own publication. Um, I think they're a bit, bit related of like, you know, how are all these items defined, how are they related to each other? Um, so I think that's probably a question for uh, Irache and or Matt if you want to jump in. Um, I kind of start, but I know that at CCI also did a lot of work about defining uh, what they were going to use as data. So I'm, I'm, I, if Anna Maria, feel free to add to this because you you have good context on that. Um, I guess that here, what we're from the perspective of the methodologies that fit into this is for us for 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 data citations to data that come through event data it will be according to the metadata designation for the object so that's that comes from the metadata um in our discussions with cci there was quite a bit of um essentially refinement about this and i think essentially what we meant by data is there is a an object that ha that we know is a data set as resource and has an identifier and the identifier may come in different versions. It may be a DOI, access your number, etc. cetera. Uh, but I don't know if Anna Maria, if you want to, to add to this from how you approach it. Yeah, I think um, we also had lots of conversations around exactly this question, what is data? And I know our views were a little bit different than your views when we started this collaboration and kind of tried to find the middle, the middle ground there. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, in our initial iterations, maybe we were considering um, or again, I think I think it varies, but we would not have considered something like PDB, for instance, or, uh, you know, other uh, more uh, other similar repositories, we were looking more for actually uh, kind of like, this is a very tangible data set. When we, and we did go on like some rabbit holes of, can you download it? You know, uh, can you view it? What, again, what constitutes data? Is it, should it be, is it like a sequence data? Anyway, I, I don't think there's a real concrete answer to that. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we did actually, but our initial iterations, we prioritized only eight repositories that, repositories of the 44 uh, based on our bio curations advice. So these would be like the eight repositories that we believe to be data. And I'm happy to share those, but then we decide to go broader. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, to say, I don't think there's a concrete answer and we don't have a clear definition either. Yeah, and, and just to add to that briefly, I think this is one of our motivations for what I was saying earlier about making sure there is transparency about the source because like that you can always then trace back what was the framework of, you know, we'll provide all the context as to what was the framework, what, what, what did data mean in this context, what did citation mean in this context? And also a slight clarification in case it comes up is as part of the, we, we did quite a few backs and forths on this. Um, and actually following the, the, the work that CCI did, for example, we, we noticed that there were a couple of repositories that are for clinical trials. And we decided to, for the purposes of the corpus, because we didn't know for sure there would be data sets versus just the clinical trial uh, metadata information, th those were excluded. So essentially things were pretty iterative and evolve over time as we were learning from it. Um, I think you had another question uh, in the context of this about citations that may come up later. Um, I guess the main item to mention is that from the perspective of citations through uh, DOI metadata, it is possible to update the records for the data set and other citations later. I recognize that the challenge tends to be either remembering to do it or capturing it later, unless the creator or you know the, the person who cites mentions it. Uh, but that's something that is possible. So essentially, if we if there are new citations coming over time for the same data set, again, we will capture them through the DOI uh metadata parts and for the other works that, sorry the other groups that we work with we'll have to again try to understand do we have a continuous pipeline of feeding citations or how do we best fit it into the corpus 
I, I do want to bring up one question that I know Matt has already answered, but I think it's very important. So maybe just a few words in the direction Jeroen was asking uh, or saying this does sound like a very important component in the academic infrastructure. And how do we envision this metadata and the linking to be maintained in the mid to long term, which I think is a very important question that we're seeing with a lot of open infrastructure now. Um, so maybe Matt, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So um, the current data data file is a static data file um, that we produce, but the system is set up that as we continue to ingest and maintain those links um, and grow the data file that will produce additional data files. Um, and this is part of what we want to work with the community on. And we've already done some consultations with some some aggregators already around the formats and, and uh, type of services that they would like to see to be able to track things like deltas and changes. Um, and so the, the short answer is it won't be static. It will continue to update. Um, what we have heard in most of the consultations to date is that um, the frequency of updates needs to be every either two weeks to a month, but we also want to refine that with the community um, and, and find a good frequency to make sure that we can continue to update and adjust as, as we go. And Roderick is also asking, uh, and I think this has come up before, why the first release of this uh, data file is by request only and, and kind of adding a, a hurdle for, peeping, yeah, for for sharing it openly. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that too, what the plan yeah. is. Re really good question. And and as you know, data side, our entire data file is CC0 and MIT open source code. And um, the reason we did request is because we wanted to know who was using it so we can talk to them. Sorry, my two-year-old um, also is very interested in the corpus. Um, but um, uh, not so much. Um, but we wanted to uh, talk to everyone about understanding the usage so we can improve. And that was the only reason is we wanted to know who was using it. And, and so there will be open releases, but the problem was if we just put it openly available, we wouldn't have the opportunity to engage with the community. And so um, that's not long-term, it's really just for this initial release. So we could actually talk to you and so um, I know, Roderick, you spoke to the team, I think, last week. And so we're doing that. We're actually talking to everyone that's asking for access to the data file. Um, I, I want to go over to a, a bit more technical question for Anna Maria as well. Um, uh, so Henry is asking if, if you're trying to test chat GPT-4, for example, or other models, um, would making use of that for the citation uh, corpus also improve how Chat GPT for sites data um, and on on the results of which may it may be based. Um. So is the question if you're using Chat GPT for for the cleaning task, I suppose, or for data set for data set citation, does that improve Chat GPT in any way? I think it depends. I mean, um, it depends. You know, you have an option to let it learn from your data or not. <laughs> so. Uh, if you know it, it's up to you how you want to like uh handle that uh you could choose not to have uh chat gpt learn from your data in which case it just kind of like gives you the answer uh and that's it we're also uh yeah you know i was gonna say we're also going more through the apis and fine-tuning models so i think like the learning there is more nuanced i i'm actually not sure if that data ends up being fed back into ChatGPT in any way, but that's definitely something to look into. And uh, yeah, I, I mentioned ChatGPT because you know we 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 did have we did experiment with GPT three point five and four, and they did do well in a variety of tasks. But there was another great point brought up that there are open source models as well, so you don't have to worry about that as well. Uh, you know about any of that. So um, I think they're just worth trying. And this is also a landscape that is rapidly evolving, right? So. Um... Yeah adapting to that. Okay, um, so I think we'll, it's time to wrap up soon. So I'm going to hand it back over to Irache quickly. She's going to uh, show you a little bit where, how you can reach out um, because we do want to involve everyone and we want to make this better. So this is really great that we had so many participants today. Um, we want to keep this up. Yes, thank you so much, Stefan. It's been great. I, and I know that there's been a lot of activity in the chat and the, in the Q&A. I will make sure to make a copy 
Um, I'd also be very happy to follow up with any of you who may have remaining questions or you know, want to dig into it further. We very, very much want to continue this conversation and get the feedback that we need um, as we move ahead. I just wanted to make sure that you have the relevant information if you want to get in touch. Um, if you don't hear from me first, which may happen, um, you have the, all the inf we have the information about uh, the corpus to the Make Data Account website. Uh, you're going to be receiving the recording on the slides and again, the, the dashboard link is open. So feel free to, to have a go. Um, it's already publicly available. Uh, the main thing again is that you have my contact details there as well as the contact details on data site. If you would like to email, email us again, so any feedback, anything that comes to mind after today, or if you want to have a conversation. And I also added at the bottom the, the link to the form that um, we mentioned we have. Again, very much encourage you to, to submit through there. We're very happy to share the information, not only for the data file. This is a format that we are using also to engage with those who want to learn more about the project more broadly. Um, so yes, I think with us, um, with that, thank you so much everyone for being here and for participating. And uh, yeah, again, we'll keep an eye on, on the different items that have been raised on the chat and Q&A and follow up on that. Thank you so much. Have a Thanks, wonderful everyone. day, everyone. Take care.